All right. Well, I guess that makes uh, 1.30 Central, 11 Pacific, or whatever other time zone you're in. So good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whichever applies. Uh, thanks, everyone, for uh, for joining the session. So um, the you know topic kind of says it all, right? Like um, this is for... Uh, so first off, I'm uh, Jason Harmon, CTO at Stoplight. Um, and it's a little bit helpful to know what we do as a company. Um, not that I'm doing a big demo here, but you know, API design is our thing, right? This is the platform that we're building to help people kind of collaborate on APIs. Um, you know, a big focus, I think, in recent times is on this kind of governance question. Um, for me specifically, uh, I'm CTO at, at Stoplight and head up our engineering and product teams, as well as covering some of the security and IT aspects. Um, one of the things that really brought this talk together, and it's, this is really a summary in many ways, a, a reflection of the last uh, few months of launching our API Intersection podcast. So if you haven't, uh, you know, just look on any of the podcast platforms that's published everywhere. Um, but we'll get into a little bit more of uh, what that's about. Um, I've worked on APIs for, you know, the majority of the last 10 years, um, you know, helped design APIs at PayPal and um, some of the background work going on at Expedia Group, as well as, um, you know, the kind of CTO gig at Typeform and that stuff. Been involved in a number of different communities, um, you know, uh, older days in Austin API meetup. It's hard to get that one back off the ground these days, but we're planning to. Um, also was involved in early days of RAML working group and open APIs. So, Kind of API specs, you know, have uh, been lifeblood for a while. So the podcast, back to that briefly, um, it's been an interesting experience. We really focused on, you know, people who are kind of governing API programs, you know, these folks who are conducting the reviews and providing the standards and all this kind of stuff. And we really only ask one question consistently is, you know, we'll go through how does your program work and how do you do governance? How do you do design? Um, you know, how do you scale this out to, you know, larger organizations um, from, you know, notable brands, which has been great. But uh, I'm always for the listener's sake asking, that's amazing sounding, right? That probably took years to get it operating like that. But if you were just getting started, let's say you're in a startup, you're working on your own project, where would you start? Like, what would the most important things be that you think are universally true regardless of scale. And uh, it was uh, honestly for us uh, at Stoplight, it was in a lot of ways to find out, you know, are there any significant consistency of practices going on or are there folks doing things very, very different? And the truth is we found incredible consistency in the span of about 10 episodes. Um, the answers were one of a very short list every time. And so I wanted to kind of share that back here and summarize what we've learned from this kind of uh, first, I guess, dozen episodes or so. Um, so that gets us into kind of the meat of the content here. And, uh, you know, trying to kind of be a little bit pithy on these sections and get you thinking big, because we're not going to get into a lot of tech stuff here exactly. And that's what's weird about, you know, APIs at scale. So as George Herbert said, uh, good words are worth much and cost little. And this is really just to say, one of the first things folks pointed out every time is have some kind of defined vocabulary for your platform. The idea that you can go and design an API, which is, you know, in many ways, a collection of terms without understanding what are your terms, uh, you very quickly get into squabbles over the meaning of things and misunderstandings about different understandings of what words mean. Uh, my favorite example I've shared on the podcast a few times at uh, Expedia Group when I was there helping with uh, their API platform is what does an itinerary mean? That word has no one meaning when you look across different lines of business. When you're renting a car, when you're getting a hotel, when you're taking a flight, those industries all have different notions of what itinerary means. And so as it turns out, trip is a better abstraction uh, for how you define a sort of, you know, multi-product itinerary. Um, but that was months of discussion to kind of finally reach that conclusion. Um, so the point is that, you know, sit down with the right stakeholders, the right folks, and just ask some simple questions. Like, what are all the things? What are the big things? And 
preferably what's a word that could describe them. Um, there are certainly, you know, uh, techniques to doing this. Um, I think for most engineers uh, who are on here, you're probably immediately jumping to like domain driven design. And I will say across the majority of guests have kind of gone, be careful with that. Um, it's a little too like, close to the metal, right? A little too implementation driven and can sometimes get you into implementation squabbles, which shouldn't be the point of defining what do we do? Um, business capability modeling, I think has picked up steam as kind of a, a one more inclusive way to do it because uh, you know your business folks can be involved and not feel intimidated by the arcane rules of DDD, right? Um, and the bit that I'm saying here within business capability modeling of use language that customers would understand is probably the most important facet of this. And in many ways, this is just a very deliberate expression of customer centricity is let's draw a picture on the wall of what our platform does. And if we showed it to customers, would they recognize it, right? Would they say, yes, that's my things. That's really what you're trying to get with this sort of exercise. And I will say, you know, normally with this sort of thing, I would say, here's where you would go to look at that. Uh, and clearly I could chill for stoplight here, but the truth is um, in many cases, something as simple as a marker board or in virtual world these days, I tend to lean on things like Miro, pretty much get the job done to get some basic understanding going, how you codify and kind of get that set up. You know, maybe it ends up living in you know, whatever kind of content internal, like internet publishing stuff you're using, whatever, but this isn't really an automation problem. It's a comprehensibility problem. And this is some of the, the, like everywhere I've ever been, this is one of the big problems is that you don't understand how to talk to customers. Seems pedantic, but virtually every guest has brought this up. So, uh, the kind of best way to do this that everyone generally has agreed on is, is just find the right key stakeholders and typically someone per domain in larger systems where you do have definable domains, getting a mix of kind of your maker types, your product engineering design folks, as well as some more business oriented folks, um, is helpful just to keep things from turning into a, you know, description of systems, which is. The next point, stay out of the implementation details. And when it goes there, if you're the facilitator for this, that's when you know to steer it away. Like we can sort that out later. Let's talk about what the thing is, right? Watching out for um, conjoining language where people are trying to mix two things and call it one. It's like, is it a synonym? Are they really different? Um, staying away from internal lingo acronyms. These are all common things that, that come up, right? Um, obviously, once you've got this picture, the next step is now let's start talking about what this would look like in APIs, where those boundaries would be in service implementations or what should or shouldn't be in a model, that sort of thing. In general, this is the starting point, in my opinion, on your typical inverse Conway maneuver. You're not letting the systems define what your platform will be. You're defining what your platform will be based on customer perception and then making the systems in your organization fit that model, which is to say, I think at the heart of this, your organization will become more customer centric with these kinds of approaches. Um, and if you've never read up on this inverse Conway stuff, uh, ThoughtWorks, I think has done a good job over the years at capturing the concept. Um, but it's basically fighting against the tendency for the organization that the software to reflect your organization. This is an intentional move to go in the other direction. And it starts with language, right? Um, just a quick snapshot, uh, you know, at Stoplight, we're big enough these days to start having these problems ourselves on how are we going to scale out? How are we going to service things out? So we've been going through some of these exercises ourselves and trying to capture how would our workspaces and projects and versioning and, you know, the style guides, all these different things fit together. And uh, we're very much in the middle of, you know, getting this kind of evolved into a shape that sets the vision for where our services go. Um, but we really just, you know, got together, um, you know, once or twice a week for a while and chatted through it with all the right folks. And it's really shed a lot of light on things that were maybe a little, you know, in the shadows or a little implementation driven. And it's been super helpful. Uh, so, you know, point being, this isn't a fancy thing we're doing here. It's largely put some words in boxes and draw lines, and it actually can get you a long ways. On to our next topic, um, again, starting with a pithy quote that success lies in a masterful consistency around the fundamentals. And this is 
from somebody who, you know, speaks to leaders and that sort of thing. And this is really just, you know, to draw on the fact that consistency is part of, you know, that's really what makes a bunch of APIs feel like one platform is consistency and design. The way to get there, and this is actually probably one of the, this, this probably should have been number one if I went back and tallied it up, but it just went off a gut. Maybe it was number two. Either way, a lot of folks pointed to have a style guide, right? And if you have a style guide, you should take a look at uh, automating as much of that as you can. So uh, the, the simple version of this is, you know, look at how you do conventions and agree on what they are. So, you know, do you use spine case or, you know, uh, snake case in your path and parameters and those kinds of things? Have that discussion, have that debate, and then record that and never speak of it again, right? <laughs> Design it once, have a convention and apply it everywhere. Now, you know, when you're getting into how do you maintain that, that's where this automation question really comes up. Um, so, you know, we'll, we'll jump to that in a sec. Uh, the, before that, though, um, the other bit I would point out is like, you know, there's so many great examples of APIs that are great to use. Don't be afraid to steal, right? You're not reinventing the wheel here. Find something that looks good and steal it. It's not a bad idea. And there's actually a decent amount of style guides out there. Uh, our friend Arnaud Laurent has uh, done a great job over the years at trying to collect these at apistylebook.com, um, which I, you know, where it has it, he's working on a refresh. So hopefully we'll see even more there soon. Um, and I wanted to point out too, we learned from uh, 42 Crunch that like this actually is a good place to find security issues too. So really thinking about, can you define some rules around how you define auth? You can actually avoid a huge amount of security issues just by defining that in your style, right? Um, so I think there's you know different levels of engagement here. The starting point, if you don't have anything, again, get the right folks together, agree on some basic conventions, and write it down somewhere and point everyone to it. That's a great starting point, right? At least you agree on something, you've documented it somewhere. A better step, um, and you know this is certainly a, a bit of a you know. Uh, pointing to stuff that Stoplight does, uh, which I didn't set anyone up for. We asked the question and they answered it and referenced this re frequently is uh, Spectral is an open source project of ours that um, basically allows you to define a rule set and apply that to your APIs. Um, obviously, if you set up that kind of linting, um, you know, we provided in design time if you're a Stoplight uh, platform subscriber, but a lot of folks set this up in like PR hooks or Git hooks from PRs, um, CICD checks, things like that, um, where you can just kind of keep an eye on you're not releasing you know, inconsistent stuff accidentally. And it means that when you sit down to do reviews, you can talk about substance. You know, Does this thing belong here? Does this make sense in the context of everything else? Is it really using customer language? All those things, rather than, you know, I think this should be spine case, not snake case. You just don't want to waste time on those discussions. So that's the big advantage to this automation. And uh, we've got that out there for you. Uh, next up uh, is an example of what that looks like. Uh, I think it's one of the better examples out there of um, kind of a blend of writing down all the rules and having uh, Spectral as an automation tool to, to make their review process easy. Um, so if you just go to GitHub's or sorry, Adidas's GitHub, you'll see uh, their API guidelines out there. I think it's a it's a great example of what good looks like, and kudos to them for sharing it publicly. So, um, you know, I would certainly encourage you if you have these things, um, don't be afraid to share them. Um, I think there's always stuff you that you want to keep internal, certainly mm -hmm. around auth and some of those things. But I think the more the community shares how you look at your style book for APIs. Um, the more consistent we all get, right? And kind of our final big point, um, you know, the, the, the big trick here in reliable systems is somehow to achieve simultaneous centralization and decentralization. And this is from basically the guy who introduced this notion of loose coupling into, you know, how we think about organizations. This is to set up to think about governance and as a function in your company, how do we do it? And um, you know, the first assumption I make in this topic is that you are doing some kind of review process for your APIs. I'm not gonna go into that a ton here, but it's just to say if you're not reviewing APIs before they get built, 
before they go out the door, you're in trouble. Um, so you should. Um, but if you say there is one team that does this for everyone, it will be the bottleneck. Like it's not a question of if it's for sure going to happen, that's going to slow you down. And that's not what we want governance to do. Right. Which is also to point to a trend, I think over the last five, 10 years that these kind of center of excellence type models aren't really working out that great. Um, it's formed typically as more of a gate that you have to pass through. And the perception has been, you know, that slows us down. And there's, I don't know, there's some kind of superiority complex too with you're excellent and we're not. Anyways, um, point is that an enablement style approach works well, which is to say that, you know, uh, like at, at, when I worked at PayPal and we worked with teams, we tell them, look, we're here to make you look like everyone else and look cool, right? Uh, we're here to help you get out the door with something that's great. Um, and you don't have to know it all. That's what we're here to help you fill in the blanks on of how our system, how our, our rules, our, our style works. Um, and ultimately at the end, what you're really looking for back to our decentralized is you can have a centralized team to pull these things together to have kind of your program. But in the end, as you go through these reviews, you should really be looking for what I call like your band of rebels is, you know, who are the thought leaders in each domain who are passionate about APIs and, and how they're designed and platform consistency and all these things, teach them to fish, right? Give them more autonomy to actually perform those reviews um, you know, with some guidance at first, but once you've built a trusted relationship, great. Um, you're the subject matter expert on APIs in your given area. Um, and this central team can kind of keep track of that, you know, if you're all using the same tools, um, but you don't have one group that everyone has to rely on. Uh, and then your domain experts are the ones who are learning APIs and it just becomes part of what you do. Um, and those central folks become curators of kind of what is our style guide? What are our standards? That sort of thing. Um, a little more practical uh, stuff that I think popped out that weren't as big of themes. Um, one is that uh, this kind of mocking approach, uh, 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 mocking and documentation really are complementary in some ways. But the first is make sure that you're documenting something about your APIs when you're in abstract design. Again, this is assuming a design first style approach. Um, you know, share what you think this thing does in human words up front rather than just a bunch of schema. That gives better feedback, right? When you show this API design to someone, you're good. if they know what it does in you know rough terms from just a description, that may actually be more valuable than providing detailed schema. So that's kind of our good approach. The better is having some kind of mocks out there, um, sort of fake APIs based on that abstract design so that your consumers can actually build something against it and get what I call tactile feedback. You can touch it, you can feel it, and you're gonna learn more from it. Um, we, we actually recently shared an example from WeFox who started using mocks and they're quoting like, you know, 60% faster development timelines because their front end and back end can parallelize based on an abstract design. Um, so uh, again, plug for some open source stuff that we do. Um, if you look at uh, Stoplight's Prism, uh, it's uh, a mocking kind of proxy that you can put in front of an open API spec and kind of provide fake APIs, right? Uh, and get all these benefits. So some kind of closing thoughts, some big picture perspective. I said at the beginning, we're not gonna get into a lot of technical stuff, which is weird, right? For your building APIs, you would think you would. Um, and I think this is because, you know, these transformations of moving toward platform thinking, toward building everything in APIs, they're hard because of the culture change that's implied. It's not really a technology problem. Once you agree on what the things are and, you know, uh, the architecture of how you're going to do it, which isn't really that complicated uh, in most cases, it's, uh, you know, the rest goes fast. So I think recognizing that if you're starting to head down this road, um, you know, leveling up your customer centricity across the organization is critical where you're going to have APIs full of weirdness. Um, you know, focusing on this consistency is more important than anything in developing APIs gets you something that feels like a platform. Um, I'm certainly, you know, Stoplight as a company and myself included, uh, you know, we're big adherents of design first, meaning design the API before you build it. So you don't have rework, you can parallelize, you have awareness and, you know, that you're building it so you don't have duplication of effort. 
And as we said before, with this inverse Conway maneuver, build for your capabilities or design for your capabilities, not around the systems or UXs that you have necessarily. And, uh, and that kind of contract-based approach in design first lets you parallelize again. So that's all I got. So I guess that puts us into kind of our Q&A room, which I'll go peek. Looks like we don't have questions yet. Uh, and I also think we're up on time here shortly. But uh, feel free to dump your questions in the Q&A tab, and I'll see if I can answer with uh, if you're not jumping to the next session already. So I'll look through the list here and pick on somebody that I know is noisy and always has questions, which, by the way, I like. Uh, let's see. We'll look in chat anyway, since there's no Q&A. All right, here we go. What people or skills should the centralized team consist of? Uh, I think it's a great question of, you know, who do you pick? And for my money, the most important thing is people that have that enablement mindset meaning that you know you, you have individuals who you know uh, are motivated by seeing other people succeed certainly you end up with folks with good leadership skills to some extent and good communication skills obviously um, but it's it's really just the way that people approach um, the the authority that they've been given that they're using it to enable other people that's the most important obviously having you know subject matter expertise on what good apis look like um you know how to engage and decentralize with the whole organization um, how to ignore organizational boundaries and just you know dotted line everything you do i think these are all kind of ingredients but if that first one's wrong if you have somebody who thrives on wielding power uh, everything will fall apart because everyone will hate your governance Oh, I like that line uh, from Terry here, be a coach, not a dictator. Yeah, it's perfect. I always, I always said like, you know, if you could be king for a day, what kind of king would you be, right? <laughs> um, and it, there's certainly power in those reviews. Um, let's see, if no other questions, I'll take the chance to ask how you guys intend to build canonical masking into your tools from David. So I presume David, this is, uh, sorry, from Anthony Freitas. I assume this is a stoplight question. Um, Canonical masking, uh, maybe a better description would help. Um, we do some level of, um, uh, like, uh, part of what you might be referring to is, uh, like, this ability to kind of share models between APIs, and when you do share them, mask them. Um, this is actually stuff that, you know, for folks that use Stoplight, um, we have some kind of experimental versions of that we're, you know, kind of cautiously uh, offering up uh, access to. Yeah, trimming properties from models when reference. Yeah, so when you share some model, you might want to only include certain properties of that model given that reference. So we do actually kind of quietly, secretly support it. So if you're using Stoplight, um, you know, reach out and we can talk about maybe toggling you into that. But that is all just to say that stuff that isn't that far on the horizon for us. These are things we're testing out with closed audiences now. All right, did I miss any questions? See if anybody put anything in Q&A up. Oh, same thing. Okay, same question. I think we answered that one. Let's see. Uh, hey, Marsh, I haven't talked to you in forever. It's like management in general, you get the best results when you help create the environment in which people do their best work. Yeah, I, I mean, I call this servant-based leadership, but I think where people get confused with API design governance is there's this feeling that, um, that you're leading the thing. And the thing that's hard to swallow after a while is realizing you're along for the ride, right? Um, the company is on a journey and you're just a facilitator and getting everyone else to where they can operate and do these things. That's the key, right? Is getting them uh, individually enabled. And I agree that that totally applies to how you manage and lead in general. And frankly, it's, uh, I think that whole API governance process and learning it made me certainly a hell of a lot better leader in how to enable people. So couldn't agree with you more. We need to talk, Marsh. It's been too long. All right. Well, it looks like the questions dried up. And uh, I'm sure you're all moving on to other sessions here shortly. Take one last peek.
Ah, okay. There was actually one more good one in here uh, from Rahul. Any tips on incentivizing folks who help with reviews rather than just relying on good citizenship? Um, you know, another thing I probably should have included in the deck um, that came with digging on some of these questions is um, you, you kind of, you really want like significant management support. If you're like, you know, you've decided uh, this company could benefit from building a platform based on APIs and you're just off doing it alone. I empathize. I've done it many times myself, but you should really be leading, uh, managing up to get that mandate. Uh, and, you know, some people love the Bezos style, everything shall be services. I don't, you know, I think there's some naivete involved in that a lot of times, but having some clear support uh, that this is important to what we are becoming as a company, we are on a transformation journey. If you haven't really crossed that kind of, you know, leadership and messaging boundary yet, it's, it's a long road. Um, so it's worth spending your time building the understanding with your leaders of why this is so important if they haven't recognized it already. In my experience, uh, you know, these days, uh, just about everybody's on a journey. Uh, you know, everybody's begun that path. You've got some kind of support. So the, the other version of that answer would be like, if you have this support, you're, the whole company's moving in this direction, but no one wants to do the API reviews. Uh, you know, that's certainly a thing. And, and when you're talking about decentralizing, how do you incentivize them? That's where my biggest uh, my biggest advice is just ignore the burn, the, the org chart, ignore the organizational leaders on paper. You have to go find who is the thought leader on APIs in that given area, because they're dying to be given the authority to, to help everyone. Right. Uh, and again, you want to make sure they have the right mindset. Um, but I think for me, you don't have to incentivize folks it, because there's probably someone there. And if there's not, then raise that flag quality with leadership in that organization that you're going to have a struggle here. You're not going to get there if you don't have someone who everyone looks to when API questions come up. And sometimes that means redistributing talent around the company a little bit to make sure that you have someone who in a given dev center or domain can be that subject matter expert. So that was like a super windy answer, but a really big question. So hopefully it helped. Uh, all right, and another one here from Jeremy Field. What are some examples of artifacts an enablement team might prepare or use? Spectral config, naming guidance. Um, yeah, so again, if you look at some of the like public style guides that are out there, um, which include spectral, and that's certainly a facet, um, you know, uh, that's helpful usually to get a, a better idea of what it looks like. I would say, you know, having some common definition of models that are shared across APIs, uh, goes right along the side, um, you know, defining your basic conventions and kind of style. Um, those two, you know, are, are really important starting point for, for most programs. But within all that is what uh, material do you have to kind of describe your process for reviewing APIs and what that means for the people who are engaging in it. Um, so a lot of people will think, you know, if I don't pass my review, I can't go to production and you're going to delay my project. And that may not be true in your given context. It could be that you're, you know, you're scoring this up and, and having a maturity that you've, uh, you've evaluated and that there's a minimum required, but you have to explain those things. So I think process documentation, uh, some form of style guide and some understanding of what are common models that would apply across the board. An example being like, you know, we only describe contacts with this universal contact model that works well with our, you know, geolocation and, um, you know, address verification systems or whatever. You might say everyone should be using this model. Um, I think those are your kind of typical essential ingredients. Uh, and beyond that, it just, I think, gets more nuanced as you go down the pile. Probably the only other exception would be auth is having some kind of clear description of how does auth work inside of your platform. And if you're just building external APIs, obviously you got to explain auth. It should practically be the first thing on the page, right? Because it's, uh, it's going to be the hardest thing to do to get started. Um, oh, a great note from Martin here on um, example code, for sure. I think that's universal across the board. Uh, you know, 
the other assumption I have in here is that you're using a spec format uh, to catalog your APIs, um, you know, to design them, that kind of thing. Um, which if that's true, those things allow you to do examples and all that stuff, which also implies you you should be generating your documentation from those specs. So, uh, you know, I probably make a bad habit of assuming everyone uses APIs and to, uh, uses open API to document the rest stuff and, you know, generates documentation from it. And, you know, uh, so sorry if I'm a little myopic there, but it's, uh, it's what everybody does now. So cool. Well, I think we got all the questions answered. Uh, Chris asks, is visually diagramming with relationships of schema models on the radar for stoplight? Um, within the platform, we do have some level of this, um, not as a modeling tool per se, uh, but actually for kind of a, an inference thing. So um, you can see basically references of uh, like a tree of your models for the given API that you're looking at, which will give you an idea of where is that model shared in other APIs, stuff like that. Um, so we do some level of kind of visual modeling. The idea of defining like your universal language or your grammar or whatever you want to call it, um, I would not say that that's like firmly on the near term uh, for stoplight, but it's definitely a thing that we know happens before people design APIs. And I think is, you know, front of mind for us when we think about our overall customer journey is, are they coming in the door with an understanding of that language or not? Um, there's certainly a question of, is that something we should be building or, or someone else? But we know it's a problem. We know it's there. Um, I just, frankly, there's so many other things that we can do to help get programs up and running you know, healthy and fast that um, that are much more technical and automated that we can build software for clearly. I think this one, like a marker board does such a damn good job. I don't know that I want to build a thing that, uh, that counters that. So squishy answer, but that's what you expected. All right, I think we got it all done. So thank you everybody and uh, have fun in your next sessions. <laughs>